Dr. Sarah Giddings. Uh, thanks for joining us. This is pretty cool what you guys are doing. Love the name. Kudos on that. Can you tell me a little bit about PINK and what it actually means and, and the work that you're doing? Absolutely. So PINK stands for Plumes in Nearshore Conditions. And what this is, is this is a science experiment trying to understand how small rivers, which when they come out, they come out as a plume, interact with breaking waves in the surf zone, which is the near shore. So we're trying to understand how things coming out of estuaries and rivers spread in the coastal ocean. And where are you doing this experiment? So we were doing this experiment at uh, Torrey Pines State Beach um, in California. And it's actually pink, right? So visually people could see actual pink waves, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we release a bright pink dye into the water to basically act as a water tracer. And the idea is that that can show us where the plume is going, which can help us understand implications for other things that get carried in plumes. Um, estuaries and rivers are the connection between the land and the coastal ocean. And so these rivers and plumes bring with them things from the land, some of them negative things like pollutants, but also some positive things like nutrients um, and phytoplankton, larvae, sediment. And so if we can understand where the plume itself goes, we can understand where the things that it's carrying also go. So is there a reason why it's pink and is it safe? I assume. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. It is a safe dye. Um, it's been approved by a whole bunch of different agencies for use for water tracing studies specifically. Um, the reason for pink is that there's just a couple of, of dyes that have been approved for this type of use. And um, the two most common ones with the, these types of studies, one is bright yellow, like a highlighter, and the other one is this pink one. And the pink is a lot easier to see by the naked eye. So it worked better with your acronym too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this must have been alarming to people. Is it still visible? How long did the pink last and how far did it reach? So the pink to our naked eye only lasts for four to six hours. Um, and in this, these particular releases, it traveled a few kilometers up and down the coast um, and uh, several hundred meters offshore, actually uh, about a kilometer offshore. The In prior releases, we've seen it travel even farther up to like 10 kilometers along shore. Um, but the, the dye itself mixes just like the river water does with the ocean water, such that the concentration becomes less visible within those first five to six hours. We have instruments that can keep measuring the dye for about 24 hours. And then after that, it's diluted to concentrations that we can't detect. And are you watching it from above? How are you tracking it? Yeah, so we had all sorts of fun instruments to track the dye. So we had moorings, which are instruments that are fixed to the seafloor and some floating. And those instruments have on them current meters to measure the, the how the water is moving around, salinity, temperature, as well as fluorometers. So for measuring the dye specifically, fluorometers are the key um, because it's a fluorescent dye. And so we had fluorometers on moorings we also had a jet ski and the jet ski had mounted to it fluorometers as well as salinity temperature sensors. So someone's out there on a jet ski running back and forth measuring the dye. Um, and then the most novel and exciting aspects of our measuring were with drones. So we had a visual drone just to watch the dye evolve. And then we had a hyperspectral camera mounted on a drone a second drone, which you can actually get the dye concentration from this hyperspectral camera on the drone. So I'm guessing like, so, you know, we're atmospheric scientists and there's computer models to study that. What's the benefit of a field experiment like this over modeling with a computer? That is an excellent question. So 
why not just do this with modeling? We are doing modeling. So we have, this experiment is a joint modeling and um, in situ experiment. Um, and the reason for doing both is because of the level of complexity of the real environment. So we can create a numerical coastal ocean model, just like an atmospheric model that tells us you know, where things are going and how quickly and how quickly it dilutes. Um, and we have that, we have a realistic model that can do that, but we need to be able to ground truth it with some observations. So one reason is for ground truthing. Another reason is we really wanted to understand sort of the fundamental physics of how these plumes move and why. So we know that there's sort of two main modes of transport. These plumes can, if the waves are big enough and the plume is small enough, the plume can be trapped inside of the surf zone. And if the plume is trapped inside of the surf zone, it's going to travel up and down the coastline where it's, you know, most direct exposure with humans. If the plume itself is big enough, like the discharge is big enough, or the waves are really small, the plume can just eject offshore and it doesn't care so much about the waves. And we're trying to understand like where that transition happens. Where do you go from the case of something being trapped versus something being being ejected offshore? And with an in situ experiment, we can start to get at that, uh, but we can really benefit from the numerical modeling as well. And so we're using the two of them in tandem. You've done three releases over the past couple of weeks mm -hmm. what have I know this is preliminary but what have you learned so far we each release was split into two halves um where half the die was released earlier in the ebb tide the tide leaving the estuary and the other half later to get that range in the tidal conditions and so that's sort of six half releases and five of them were trapped in the surf zone and one of them escaped and so we so far have actually seen more trapping than we expected, um, which has implications for, you know, transport of pollutants and, and sediment, for example, um, just based on the wave heights and the strength of the outflow. Um, we also are seeing a very strong dominance of the bathymetry, the underwater topography of the estuary mouth. And so the shape of the mouth seems to be mattering a lot in the ultimate fate of these plumes. Um, and so those are our preliminary results. We have tons and tons of data to dig into to, to digest and get more information. So what's next? Are you hoping to do this in other locations or is this kind of a, a one-time thing? For now, it's a one-time thing. Uh, the These types of die releases take a lot of people, a lot of time, a lot of money. Um, and so they're a big, big undertaking. I would love to do more. Right now, this is it. <laughs> so we're going to sort of go back to, you know, downloading the data from the instruments, go back to our computers and really analyze things carefully. Um, maybe we'll propose some follow-ups in the future. But for now, we're done with the die releases. This project is really focused on small outflow plumes. So there's a lot of information already out there on large river, river plumes like the Columbia River and where it goes and how it spreads in the coastal ocean. Um, and in that case, in those large plumes, they don't care about the surf zone. They just bust right through the surf zone and spread offshore and their spreading is really related to winds as well as the earth's rotation um, and pressure gradients. But these small plumes have been less well studied. And so that's why we really are looking at this interaction with the surf zone, because we know that they directly interact with the breaking waves of the surf zone.